Oh, I know. I imagine. That was a video. I'm Bob Sherman. Across the table from me is Clara Rockmore and Nadia Reisenberg, except I always call them aunt and mother because it's simpler that way, uh, since they happen to be. On the other side here is Robert Moog. Uh, Dr. Moog, uh, his name is a household word now because of the synthesizer that bears it and many other electronic devices. And uh, another doctor, Thomas Ray, with us. And uh, Tom has made a study of electronic music, electronic instruments, and the whole historical pageant of it. So uh, I don't know where to begin exactly, except to say that you two have found the theremin fascinating. I've accepted as part of the house. I've grown up with it. It's been around. <laughs> I, it's sort of, it's always been there, and I understand it. What is it that fascinates you, Bob? What, what do you find special about the theremin? It's very simple, technically, considering uh, how musically rich it is. Uh, by musically rich, I don't mean you turn it on and it plays. I, I mean that a skilled musician can get a, an incredibly uh, rich music out of it. And yet inside, uh, uh, it's one of the simplest devices I know. I began building theremins as an experimenter when I was a kid in high school. And I've been at it on an amateur and semi-professional basis ever since. If it's such a simple device, how is it that every time a tube goes out, there's a major crisis here because th th they were all made in 1942 and they can't... That's the reason. <laughs> I think I can answer that. That is because Professor Termen was such a genius that he picked up whatever happened to be around. So his parts there are some of them obsolete or some of them could be handled to a frying pan for all I care, but he made it work. <laughs> but it's very difficult to substitute. Clara, when did you first meet... Theremin, under what circumstances? Well, I met Professor Termen when he came to America to demonstrate the instrument. At that time, I was a very busy uh, violinist, the pupil of Professor Leopold Auer, and uh, I was fascinated by the aesthetic uh, uh, part of the instrument, the visual, the beauty, and the idea of, of playing completely without touching anything. That part was very fascinating to me. I also loved the sound of it. And apparently I showed some kind of immediate, uh, uh, from point, point of view of Professor Termen, an immediate uh, ability to manipulate it perhaps better than the usual person. Maybe my absolute pitch helped. But at that time I was too busy playing the violin, so I completely uh, forgot it except to be admired for several years. And only later I began to work on it and uh, then he changed the first model of the instrument to a much more exacting one because I needed it for musical reasons. With the faster left hand, which permits staccato, which, uh, with, with the longer range, five octaves instead of three, which makes playing much more difficult and controlling it more difficult, but more is possible. Wait, you're skipping a little bit ahead. Uh, from this initial stage of just being curious about it, to actually starting to work on it, having him build you an instrument that is a little different to, for the specification. How did you actually begin to play it? No, I began to play it on the regular RCA model, which was then sold at uh, Shermer's or wherever, and it had a very beautiful tone. I was not happy with it because the left hand, I call it molasses, you know, you couldn't shake the note. You always had glissando, everything was connected. And uh, also the range was not uh, satisfactory to me. I wanted bass notes as well as, as high notes. It was all gig high. And Professor Termen became a great friend and admirer and was willing to do anything. In fact, we really worked on this particular instrument together. I making my musical, musical uh, demands, or not demands, probably the wrong word, the wishes known to him, and he being the the genius that he was, he was able to, to invent this one. Yeah. Bob Moog, how about the recording of the, of the theremin? Is that going to pose special problems, do you think, in terms of the, uh, of the sound quality being electronically generated in the first place? No, in fact, uh, an, el an electronic sound is generally easier to record than an acoustic sound because we have uh, more control over it. And uh, since it's already in, in electrical form, it was generated in the first place by electricity, it obviously can exist once again in electrical form in the tape recorder. Uh, an instrument like the piano is much more difficult to record accurately. That's very interesting. Yes. Uh, 